Now we will discuss polynomial functions and how they can be used in CAM design. We can use polynomials for a wider variety of applications. The general form of a polynomial is going to be as follows, where we have s, again, equal to our position of the follower, equal to c0 plus c1 times x plus c2 x squared plus c3x cubed. And this pattern continues until we get to cn x to the n. These c's that we see in the position equation are determined by the motion requirements for our CAM design. To design the polynomial function, we begin by specifying a number of conditions on the position, the velocity, the acceleration, and the jerk. These conditions that we specify are called boundary conditions, or BC. The degree of our polynomial, so if we look at our equation, the highest uh, power that we see is going to be equal to the number of boundary conditions that we have, minus 1. So if we have six boundary conditions, we will have a polynomial of degree 5. For each boundary condition, we're going to substitute into the S, V, A, or J equation to get some linear relationship between the constants, or between these various C's. And of course, we'll be hoping to see that if we have four C's that we need to determine, we will have four equations, in which case we can then solve simultaneously to get the values of each of the C's. We're going to begin by picking up an example that we started previously, um, where we're doing a single dwell um, polynomial CAM design. In the previous example we did, we used the cycloidal function from the SCCA family, and then we even tried a double harmonic for the following motion requirements. We had a rise, fall, dwell. Again, this is a single dwell application. The rise happened in 90 degrees of cam rotation, and we rose from 0 to a height of 2 inches. Our fall happened in another 90 degrees and we fell two inches back down to zero and then we dwelled for our remainder remainder of time so again some things that we recall is that the total amount of cam rotation for any design is always 360 and we see this is the case here where we have three segments a rise segment a fall segment and a dwell segment and they add up to 360 degrees this time, however, we're going to use one polynomial for the combined rise and fall. So, in effect, we are accomplishing this design with two segments, one for the combined rise and fall and another for the dwell. Now, we only need a polynomial for um, the rise and fall segments. We do not need a polynomial for the dwell because for the dwell no equation is necessary. We simply maintain the values at the end of the previous segment. Because we're using a polynomial for the combined rise and fall, this polynomial will probably have higher order than it would otherwise. Now a higher order polynomial may have desired behavior at the specified points which are the boundary conditions but it may oscillate from the desired path in between the points and we'll be able to see this after we plot the position velocity acceleration and jerk we'll look at these plots and determine if they are good enough or if we need to go back and redesign our cam the motion requirements are tabulated here for the position velocity and acceleration variables again beta and this particular design is equal to 180 because we're combining our rise and fall and our height is equal to 2 inches. So at the beginning of our motion, theta is going to be equal to 0. We're at the bottom, or s is equal to 0, our velocity is equal to 0, and our acceleration is equal to 0. Halfway through, or beta divided by 2, which in this case would be 90 degrees, we should be at the top of our rise, finish with the rise, which means we're at a position s equal to 2, and again, h and 2 are equal in this case. And at the end of the fall, we are back down to s equals 0, velocity equals 0, and a equals 0, and we're ready to dwell. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven boundary conditions for this particular CAM design. 
Since we have seven boundary conditions for the rise and fall, we will need a polynomial of degree six. And so here we have our generic position equation um, where we have a degree of six, meaning that six is the higher, high, highest power that we see. So our position is equal to C0 plus C1x, but if we've replaced our x with theta over beta, plus C2 theta over beta squared, and so on until we get the C6 theta over beta to the 6. This is always how we begin when we're doing a polynomial cam design. We start with this generic equation where it's always going to start at C0, and it's going to go as high as equal to our boundary conditions minus 1. In this case, we have 7 boundary conditions, so we go all the way up to 6. We will also need to differentiate this position equation um, to get our equations for velocity and acceleration. So again, we have our position equation shown here first, and our velocity is just a derivative of that. Now, in this particular case, we are differentiating um, our position equation with respect to theta. We're not differentiating with respect to time. And so if our position equation is given in terms of inches, then our velocity will not be inches per second, but it will be inches per radian or inches per degree. And the same is true with our acceleration function. Our acceleration function will be inches per radian squared or inches per degree squared. And so you see our resulting equation for velocity and for acceleration here. Now it's time to substitute in for the first three boundary conditions that we had in our table. So if we go back to our table, we had s equals 0, v equals 0, and a equals 0, all when theta is equal to 0. So we'll start here with this first row um, to solve for the first three constants that we have. So if when theta is equal to 0, our s is equal to 0. And so if we go back to the s equation and we plug in 0 for s, and also 0 for theta, we'll lose c1, c2, c3, c4, c5, and c6 because each of them is a function of theta and we're setting theta equal to 0 at the start. That means that we found that c0 is equal to 0 because again, remember, our s was also equal to 0. We know that again from our table where it says that when theta is equal to 0, s must also be equal to 0. And so right away, if we plug in 0 for all of our thetas, then we know that C0 is also going to be equal to 0. So we found our first constant. We found that our C0 is equal to 0. We do the same with our velocity expression. So in our table, we see that when theta is equal to 0, our velocity should also be equal to 0. And so when we go to our velocity equation, we plug in 0 for V. We plug in 0 for each of our thetas, and what we find is that 0 is equal to 1 over beta times C1. If we multiply our beta across, we see again that C1 is equal to 0, in similar fashion that C0 was equal to 0. So, so far we found two constants. We found that C0 and C1 are both equal, equal to 0. We do the same thing with our acceleration expression. Again, going back to our table, when theta equals 0, our acceleration should also be equal to zero. And so we plug in zero for all of our thetas. All of these go out. And we see that for a equal to zero, we have c2 equal to zero also. So what we found is that c0, c1, and c2, our first three constants are all equal to zero. And so c0, c1, and c2 are equal to zero. However, we still have C3, C4, C5, and C6 left, left to determine. We do the same thing for the other two rows in our table. We substitute in the last four boundary conditions as follows. When theta is equal to beta over 2, or 90, we're at the end of our rise, so S is equal to H which is equal to 1 8 C3 plus 1 16 C4 plus 1 32 C5 plus 1 64 C6. Now this looks kind of weird, so let's take a look back at the generic, I mean back at our equation for S to see where these values come from. Here's our equation for S. Again, we found that C0, C1, and C2 are all 0, and so we're starting with C3. We know that S is equal to H when we plug in theta equal to beta over 2. And so why are we plugging theta equal beta over 2? Because that is what we have for our second row. 
theta equal to beta over 2, s equal to h. And so with an h here and beta over 2 here, what we'll end up with is 1 half to the third power, 1 half to the fourth power, 1 half to the fifth power, 1 half to the sixth power. And of course, 1 half to the third power is 1 over 8. And so when we turn our attention back here, that's where our 1 8 comes from, our 1 16th. 132nd and 164th. So while we haven't determined these values of c yet, we do have an equation that says h is equal to the following. We do the same thing for our final row in our table where theta is equal to beta or 180. Um, at that point in time, it gets a little easier because if theta is equal to beta, then we have 1 for all of these locations. So 1, 1, 1, and 1. And again, the same for velocity. When theta is equal to beta, again, c1 is 0 and c2 is 0, but we'll have 1 here, 1 here, 1 here, and 1 here. And so when we look at that, we end up with the following equations for s, for v, and for a. And so if you notice, we have four equations here, 1, 2, 3, 4, and we have four unknown c's, c3, c4, c5, and c6. So these can be solved simultaneously, and we'll use a matrix form to solve them. Here's our matrix where we have placed in our equations as follows. Here's our 1, 8, 1, 16, 1, 32nd, 1, 64, or 1, 1, 1, 3a, 4a, 5a, 6a, where a is equal to 1 over beta, 6a squared, 12a squared, 20a squared, and 30a squared. And again, this is just putting our four equations in matrix form um, where each row is multiplied by this column of C's equaling H for S. And again, that was in the middle of our table, the second row. And then the last row is 0, 0, 0. If we take the inverse of this matrix, multiply it by this vector, we can solve for all of our C's, which we find as follows. C3 equal to 64H, C4 equal to negative 192H, C5 and C6, resulting in a 3, 4, 5, 6 polynomial, which are referring to the powers of the various pieces of our equation for our S equation. And of course, we could also find our velocity, our acceleration, and our jerk equations using these same constants. And then, of course, if we plot those results, we'll see that we do indeed have a polynomial, which takes our position from 0 to 2 and then back down to zero in 180 degrees, we see our velocity curve, our acceleration, and our jerk. You may recall that if we look at our maximum acceleration, it is lower than it was previously for either our double harmonic or our cycloidal. So this is a very nice um, result for our polynomial cam design. Polynomials can be used to specify many complex cam profiles. We can also use spline functions. These are another class of function that can be used to meet specified performance requirements for our CAMs, but we will not cover these in this particular course. Next time, we will use a polynomial to do a double-dwell CAM design.